is Yom HaShoah, and what we're going to discuss today is based upon Rabbi Ephraim Oshri, and he was the Rav of the Kovno Ghetto, and he f- kind of fell into that position, it wasn't his choice, and he wrote, um, be- as the Rav, he was getting asked tons of questions about different halachic issues that arose during the Holocaust. He wrote them down and ended up um, uncovering it after he survived and then further researching his responses and publishing them into a book. So again, his name is Rabbi Ephraim Oshri. You see it on the screen. And we're going to just first I'll show you a video discussing a little bit about him, an overview about him, and then we'll discuss some of the stuff he did. TorahCafe.com In 1941, residents of the Kovna Ghetto served as forced laborers, aiding the Nazi military. Rabbi Ephraim Ashri was assigned the relatively easy task of removing lice from the soldiers' clothes. <laughs> Okay, some of the um, some of the subtitles are getting cut off, but basically this is Rabbi Oshri's son, another Rabbi Oshri, and he says that his grandfather, oh, sorry, his father was in charge of the the yeshiva within the Kovna ghetto, and and he taught the students of the yeshiva, he taught the boys there like with such such strength and vigor and excitement and enthusiasm about Torah. I'm going to How could you focus on Torah learning and and be so excited about Torah learning when amidst everything that's going on around them. They're in the ghetto, the Germans are killing them. Things are horrible. And the father asked this question to Rabbi Oshri, and his response was that anything, it's because of this turmoil. They had nothing left that tomorrow, they knew that tomorrow they could die. And because they had nothing left, this was the only thing keeping them going, and this was like holding holding them together. So the world not tore, and the Jews came. The Jews fled. They just felt no one to give them. The Jews are not the Jews. That was all they had left. That was that was something that the Nazis couldn't take from them, and that was kind of like it boiled down to realizing what was important, and they studied with joy and vigor because that was what was giving them this life. In 1943, Rabbi Shapiro, the rabbi of Kovno, passed away. Bereft of leadership, the people turned to Ashri with their pressing questions regarding Jewish law. He later wrote, The inquiries to which I responded were neither academic questions posed by scholars, nor scenarios proposed by eccentrics playing theoretical games. They were questions asked by ordinary Jews who refused to be turned into instinctive animals in search of bare survival. These Jews tenaciously upheld their obligation under the Divine Covenant to observe to the best of their ability, even in the ghetto, the commandments of God's Torah, the divine blueprint of true human civilization. 
Ashri jotted down notes regarding the questions and answers and hid them in the ground. After the war, he dug them up and elaborated on the sources. These questions were the basis of his five-volume series of responsa about the Holocaust. He later wrote, I dug up my notes and proceeded to examine the sources at greater length. Only then did I begin to perceive the significance of the questions as an indelible record of Jewish uniqueness. Did our enemies ask their priests and ministers how to care for the Jewish dead? Were they concerned about whether one may use clothes stolen from a dead Jew? Did they receive dispensation to bayonet pregnant women? In contrast, I was asked detailed, astonishingly moving questions. Jews asked, what were the proper blessings to say after eating when one was forced to eat on a fast day? They asked me the correct form of a blessing one would say before going to one's death in sanctification of God. What do you say to a Jew who is a Jew unto his death? It is so elementary that tears are not sufficient. look at a couple of things I found regarding um, Rabbi Ushri and his responsa. Responsa is the term used for questions, halachic questions that are asked and the and the halachic answers that are given to them. So Rabbi Ushri wrote this book or compiled this book after getting all these questions, he compiled this book of responsa and it's called She'elo Uchuvo Mi Ma'amakim questions and answers from the depths. Now, from the depths can have a multiple meaning. From the depths of despair, from the depths of the Nazi hell they were in, from the depths of their hearts because they were so spiritual and yearning towards God, even despite where they were coming from. Okay, so let's look at um, some of the things some articles I found regarding it. Okay, so this is an article. Hold on. Okay, this is an article um, by an undergraduate. Aaron Miller helps translate the religious text one rabbi penned in secret during the Holocaust. In 1942, a Jewish hospital in Lithuania's Kovna ghetto called upon Rabbi Ephraim Oshri to resolve an ethical dilemma. The Nazis had shot a pregnant woman in front of the hospital. The baby could be saved with a C-section, but the procedure would kill the woman. Oshri determined that the baby had a higher likelihood of survival, so the doctors performed the operation. Oshri documented this incident, along with many others, that tested Jews' devoutness on cement sacks, which he buried in the ghetto. After the war, he retrieved and published these responsa, these opinions, these legal, um, these halachic questions and answers as the five volume Shilos and Chuvos Mima Makim. Okay, and now this 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 person is trying to translate them. Okay, let's go down. Um oh, this is interesting. Okay, so she says that it's ingrained in you to be Jewish. It's more than just following the laws. It was never a question of whether the Jews were going to continue to follow Jewish law. That would be giving up their humanity. Under the threat of death, the Jews held worship services, big matzot, and said blessings over their meals. So like we saw in the video, it's so clear that adhering to halacha and learning Torah was what was holding them together. That's what was keeping them going. That was all that they had left. And that's, and not only was it all that they had left, but it was literally their lifeline. 
in ordinary conditions, rabbis consult texts like the Talmud. Um, but, here, I'll skip that, that doesn't really matter. Um, during the Holocaust, the rabbis were deprived of these religious resources. So, Oshri is best known among many rabbis who relied upon their own judgment in unthinkable circumstances. It's very important to realize that the, the answers that he is giving are they need to be answered in real time. He doesn't have t- time to check different svarim that he doesn't even have access to. Okay, so let's see. Let's continue on. Some of the stories from the responsa are uplifting in the commitment and dedication of the Jewish people to their faith, and others are incredibly difficult to read. Deeply saddened by the unimaginable choices Jewish people had to make and extremely difficult answers the rabbis had to deliver. And I don't think those two things are mutually exclusive, meaning the responsa can be simultaneously uplifting as well as incredibly difficult to read and deeply saddening. Because the uplifting aspect of these questions are the fact that they're being asked in the first place. Because this is what the people, despite everything going on around them, or perhaps in spite of everything going on around them, this is what people were worried about. This is what people are interested in, doing the right thing. Because again, just remember, when everything else falls is crumbling beneath them, they just want to live morally in the best way that they can. Um, And she says, I mean, you could read it if you'd like, but she basically says that she's deeply touched by not only the questions that were asked, but the sensitivity in which he answered them. That he knows he's living firsthand the same the same situations that these people who are asking the questions are living through so he knows the difficult times that they're facing he knows the difficult choices that they're facing and he answers them with such astute sensitivity and beauty and um and and and, and reassurance okay so um, as Oshri said in 1975 interview with the New York Times, one resists with a gun, another with his soul. Meaning the way Oshri explains it, the way Rabbi Oshri explained it was that this was his form of resistance against the Nazis. That teaching Torah and, and, and continuing to answer Torah questions was his way of resisting of his form of a resistance against the Nazis, not by a partisan um, warfare, not by guerrilla warfare, not by anything like that, but he did it. He, he was on the front lines in a spiritual way to preserve humanity. He wasn't just preserving their, their, um, actual, you know, lives, he was preserving their humanity within whatever lifespan they had left. And let's see here. Um, this is another article. Hold on. Sorry. Okay, so of the 111 questions presented in the book, 62 were present were posed during the Nazi occupation in the Kovna Ghetto. 47 were were after liberation. Okay, so basically he wasn't just dealing with issues happening in real time of of impending death, but he was also dealing with issues happening shortly thereafter. Okay, 17 questions deal with hunger and eating non-kosher food. 19 questions deal with forced labor and working on Shabbos. 11 questions deal with desecrating synagogues and holy scriptures. 24 questions deal with hiding among non-Jews, assuming a Christian identity. So these were really serious issues that he had to not only deal with in real time, but deal with sensitively and accurately. Um, and here it says, um, Rabbi Oshri, uh, one second, sorry. I lost it. Um, 
lost where I went to see. Okay, so returning to Rabbi Oshri in the Kavna Ghetto, he was the only rabbi among approximately a dozen speakers who lectured in the, in the ghetto to the general public. The topic of his lectures were natural sciences. Um, sorry, that's really not something I need to talk about. Okay, the um, so good. Okay, Rabbi Oshri listed five questions presented to him by these by this um this these students that asked him questions during during the, his time in the Kavna ghetto. Abelo sought ways to fulfill the mitzvah of tzitzit. There were no tzitzit available in the ghetto. There was no way to obtain tzitzit from any other place. Abelo had found a way. He worked in one of the workshops where there was wool available and he planned to steal some strands of wool and bring them to the ghetto for the purpose of spinning them into tzitzit. His precise questions were, is it permissible to fulfill the mitzvah with tzitzit made from stolen wool? So the basis of the question is that stolen objects cannot be used to fulfill the mitzvah, to fulfill mitzvot in general. Okay, but this is crazy question to be asking when you're talking about life and death and this young boy young guy is worried about wearing tzitzit he's he want all he wants to do is wear tzitzit and he wants to do it properly if he's going to do it he wants to do it properly that he was anxious it says they were especially anxious to fulfill the myths of tzitzit probably because they didn't know what was in store for them. They wished to wear tzitzit at all times so that if they were taken to be killed, they would be buried wearing tzitzit in accordance to the Jewish burial customs. In the end, his ruling was that it was permissible. Another example deals with psychological resilience, which I honestly think is basically the whole premise of the book, whether they realize it or not, is this psychological resilience. That... It's not a life or death situation, but a small act of resistance. And it's these small acts of resistance that really, he says, which carry a powerful significance. But it's these small acts of resistance that made them feel human, that made them feel connected to Hashem and connected to each other and connected to the Torah. Before Jewish slave laborers were let off to work, the Germans would line them up for a head count. To make sure everyone was present, the workers were ordered to stand hatless and were greeted by German guards. During my studies with, with, I guess, with his yeshiva, I explained that all of us shared a responsibility to inspire our fellow Jews. Something as simple as one Jew greeting another Jew would strengthen their broken spirit. So we t- undertook to say shalom whenever we saw each other. It was a word the Germans would not likely to construe as a greeting. One of the students, Meir Ablo, same kid as before, asked, since Shalom is one of the names of Hashem, how can we say it with a bare head? Again, is the question such an outrageous question? No, it almost seems silly, and if you'd ask it today, people would probably mock you. But the point is that they were trying to hold on to whatever vestige of human decency, of, of psychological freedom that they could. Um, his writings are most extensive and they are of vital importance. Again, not only do we see the, the small acts of resistance that it takes to even just write a letter to a rabbi and the small act of resistance that it takes to even think of the question, but the fact that he got so many just shows how many people cared to live in to live and to die al pikidash Hashem and in the completely proper way. And this is such an important, um, an important artifact, I would say, from the Holocaust because of, of, of it really shows the human side of all of this. Um, and these examples are merely a very small portion of historical stories found within the response written by various rabbis. This literature is an important source that can be utilized for historical research. It can include unique information that can't be found elsewhere. It, sometimes people will confide things with their spiritual leaders regarding various dilemmas that they haven't confided in others. As presented here, even during the tragic times in pre-war Germany and ghettos and in camps, Jews made every effort to continue diligent Torah learning and the Torah 
observance of religious commandments and moral values. They turned to their rabbis for guidance. Okay, so we see through all of these things that these were acts of, of resilience. They were acts of, of almost rebellion, psychological rebellion, and acts of holding them together. They were literally um, the Torah and, and, the, and the mitzvot, when everything else fell away that's what kept them going and that's what that was their lifeline and you see we see faith optimism in the face of devastation i'm reading right here and it's humbling as we encounter these heroes and even if they didn't do anything obviously heroic thinking in terms of of thinking in a human way thinking in a way in which they actually care to preserve their humanity, that is a heroic feat. And I hope that we could all kind of take that with us, especially in our current situation with this. Obviously, I'm not comparing this to the Holocaust, but we are in this difficult, confusing, and, and like surprising, um, never before seen almost situation um, and I think in those ways, it might be similar to the Holocaust that we like, we kind of don't know what to do with ourselves. Like it's, this is not, this is, this is a unique historic event. And in those times, 